Our next speaker is Andrew Gallimore, uh, who's a lecturer in biology, and he spends his spare time thinking about consciousness and psychedelic drugs. <laughs> Parenthetically, uh, I rode the bus up here with him, and I asked him if he had samples for the audience and make this experiential, and unfortunately he said no. Uh, the topic of his title, or the topic of his talk, is Building Alien Worlds, the Neuropharmacological and Evolutionary Implications of the EMT Flesh. DMT Flesh. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm just going to microphone down. Okay, uh, I'm conscious about time, so dive straight into this. Friends, Right here and now, one quantum away, there is raging a universe of active intelligence that is transhuman, hyperdimensional, and extremely alien. Terence McKenna, uh, who spoke those words, um, wrote and spoke extensively about DMT. He can certainly be credited with popularizing at least the idea of smoking DMT, although very few people. Um, have dared, even after listening to him, rave about it. Uh, he certainly inspired me to embark on what I can only imagine will be a uh, lifelong fascination with this truly uh, astonishing molecule. The idea that you can take two or three longfuls of uh, a simple molecule like DMT and within 30 seconds be transported to what appears to be a fully autonomous, hyper-technological alien reality is uh, exciting. And I, I really don't believe that anybody who's serious about consciousness and serious about understanding the nature of reality needs to take DMT. Um, as Terence McKenna would say, um, if you've got 10 minutes uh, of your time, I can show you. Um, okay, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the effects of DMT. Uh, there are plenty of uh, books available. Um, briefly, the DMT flash is normally smoked. The, in, the onset is extremely rapid and extremely intense. Uh, thought it doesn't last that long, only a few minutes, but the consensus world, if you like, is very rapidly and completely replaced by this extremely bizarre, hyper-technological alien reality. And normally, um, alien entities or certain entities are normally present and often infest uh, this space. What's particularly noticeable is that everybody, given a high enough, high enough dose, seems to go to the same place. Um, I'll just give a one or two examples. This is from Rick Strassman's book, DMT, the Spirit Molecule. Um, a space station below me and to my right. Presences were guiding me to a platform. I was also aware of many entities inside the space station, automatons, android-like creatures that looked like a cross between crash test dummies and Empire troops, troops for Star Wars, except they were living beings, not robots. They were doing some sort of routine technological work and paid little attention to me. And this kind of thing comes up again and again. And the idea that um, normally comes across is that these are highly advanced, highly intelligent uh, entities, like vastly more capable uh, than us. Often they, they, they actively try to interact uh, with the tripper as well, and um, some people describe them as kind of elf-like, and being an elf myself, uh, I'm particularly interested in this aspect of the experience. Uh, often they kind of welcome, you know, lights start flashing, and um, they kind of welcome and then say goodbye at the end and tell them they love them and all these kind of things. It's, it's, um, it's remarkable, really. Um, so, Terence McKenna was bold enough to say that given a high enough dose, you get elves. Everybody gets elves, and this is truly, truly remarkable. So, what I'd like to do is give a few new ideas or, uh, of how DMT, first of all, is able to switch the brain very rapidly from this consensus reality uh, into a this bizarre alien reality, and why DMT is so special and, and being unique in being able to do that. So first we need to um, be clear that if a world appears to consciousness, it's, it's built by the brain. Now I'm not going to say anything about the nature of the external world at all, but if a world is to be uh, so to seen uh, to appear to consciousness, it must be built um, by the brain. If the brain can't construct a the world, then you can't um, you can't see a world, you can't experience a world. Um, so it's easy to get dragged into kind of questions about is the DMT world real or is it built by the brain? But these are not independent. These are not independent. I'll give you a better question to ask um, later. 
So for, to understand how the brain constructs, builds the DMT reality, which it must do if it's to appear to consciousness, we should first probably look at how the brain builds consensus reality. Uh, and the key to that really lies within the cortex, or the cortex of the brain, but also the, the thalamus, this deep subcortical structure, is highly interconnected. So I'll refer to this as the thalamocortical system. Now, the thalamocortical system builds worlds using functional segregation and integration. Now, the best way to understand this is to break the, the, the cortex up into a columnar structure, into, a, into a, an array of columns. And this is actually the way that the neuroscience uh, regards the, the cortical columns as being the basic function, uh, unit of functional segregation. Um, here we can see the columns from the side showing the, the layers of the cortex. Um, I call them cortical columns, but really they're thalamocortical columns because each specific region of the cortex, each cortical column, is reciprocally connected to a specific region of the thalamus. There are also these non-specific interactions, connections, that allow the whole, all of these functionally segregated uh, thalamocortical columns uh, to be unified, to form a unified structure which allows for a unified world. So to explain how this works, first I'll take an extremely simple world, probably the most simple world you can imagine, I'll take a simple red square moving in a particular direction. Now this is the perceived visual object, but it has a cortical representation. So we need to understand how does the brain build that world? Well, the different features of the object are represented or built using different components of the, uh, the cortex. So motion, colour, form, texture, etc., etc., all represented by uh, different functionally uh, specific columns. They're also unified by the connectivity between them. So this is kind of the, the, the pattern, the, the activation pattern that represents this object, this moving uh, red square. Now we can extrapolate this uh, to how the build world, sorry, how the brain builds highly complex um, realities that we, of course, we are all aware of right now. When you've only got a few columns, as illustrated here, you can only build a limited number of worlds with a limited number of features. But when you've got an extremely complicated, enormous array of thalamocortical columns, you can build worlds with uh, practically limitless complexity. And, and the world that is built is highly informative because you've got this, uh, billions of these uh, functionally distinct thalamocortical columns, but also unified because all of the thalamocortical columns are integrated by these patterns of connectivity. Now, the consensus world is very stable, it's very predictable. So, all possible patterns of activation of the thalamocortical columns are not normally accessible. And the reason is because connectivity, so the patterns of connection between thalamocortical columns, determines what we call the, the intrinsic activity, the ongoing patterns of act activation of the brain, of the thalamocortical system. So um, this connectivity determines the repertoire, if you like, of thalamocortical states and patterns of activation that can be adopted. So this creates a very stable, predictable world uh, that we're all very, very familiar with. So this kind of begs the question, how did the thalamocortical system learn to build this world? And the best guess we have at the moment is that over time, so I mean evolution, development and experience, sensory data or patterns of sensory data from the, the external world uh, were sampled by the thalamocortical system. And this um, strengthens and weakens certain connections. The connections I've shown here suggest kind of an all or nothing, either it's there or it's not. This is not true. There are degrees of connectivity. There are weak connections, strong connections, excitatory and inhibitory connections. Mm -hmm trying to show the kind of patterns of connectivity. So over time, the brain, the thalamocortical system, develops this set of connectivities that means that the intrinsic activity, in other words, the patterns of activation that are ongoing in the thalamocortical system, generate this world as a default state. And that's very important. And in fact, the intrinsic activity of the thalamocortical system dominates the construction of your world. A very small amount of information is actually used to build the world you see at the moment. This is what we call extrinsic information, extrinsic data. So this pattern of sensory data is, um, it modulates ongoing intrinsic activity of the thalamocortical system, or to put it another way, is matched to ongoing activity of the thalamocortical system. 
Um, so the built world, the consensus world, is a default state of the brain, modulated but not created by extrinsic sensory data. Uh, we know this, of course, because if you go to sleep at night, the primary sensory areas of the brain that, that normally um, receive the extrinsic sensory data are deactivated, the thalamus, or certainly the relay portions of the thalamus are deactivated, uh, and yet the brain is perfectly capable of constructing a world in exactly the same way as it does during waking. In fact, REM sleep and waking are functionally equivalent, and this has been shown uh, numerous times. So the brain builds worlds during dreaming in exactly the same way as it does when it's awake. The difference is when you're awake, the intrinsic activity of the thalamocortical system is modulated by extrinsic sensory data. That is not the case during dreaming, as far as we know. So really the question about DMT is not, is it built by the brain? It must be. All worlds that you perceive are built by your brain. They're built using intrinsic activity of the thalamocortical system. The waking world we know is modulated by extrinsic sensory data. The dream world isn't, apparently. So the question really is not is the DMT world real, but is it modulated by extrinsic sensory data? Uh, and the, the answer to that is we don't know. But if the brain is capable of building the DMT world, which is really remarkable in itself, we know that the brain learned to build the consensus world, then did the brain learn to build the DMT world, and I would suggest that it must have done. Uh, now, to explain this, we need to look a little bit more at the thalamocortical system. In fact, we'll look at this, this is a thalamocortical loop, or a highly simplified representation. Um, in the thalamocortical loop, it generates these gamma oscillations, which allows these cortical columns not only to be sort of simultaneously activated, but also to be synchronized, so they're oscillating uh, synchronously. Uh, now, I'm going to direct attention to these apical dendrites of the cortical pyramidal neuron because they contain two really important serotonin receptors. The 5-HT, 5-HT by the way is serotonin, 5 hydroxytryptamine The 5-HT1A and the 5-HT2A. Now, the 1A receptor tends to uh, lower the excitability of the pyramidal neurons and thus the thalamocortical loops and thus the, the cortex as a whole and also inhibits gamma oscillations. The 2A receptor does the opposite. It depolarizes the neuron, it makes it more likely to fire, i.e. increases excitability, uh, and it also promotes gamma oscillations in these thalmocortical loops. Now normally serotonin binds to both, and so it actually uh, tunes the pyramidal neurons, tunes the thalmocortical system to a certain level of excitability. And what classical psychedelics like LSD, psilocybin, DMT in fact do, uh, is they're able to selectively bind to 5-HD2A, and so they tune the pyramidal neurons to different degrees, depending on the drug, uh, towards excitation, towards the promotion of gamma oscillations. Now the effect of that overall is, first of all, an increased sensitivity to an incoming sensory data, but also enhanced gamma oscillations in these thalamocortical loops. Uh, and the result are these novel activation patterns. So normally, the world is stable, it's predictable because of these uh, connectivities that have developed through evolution, development, and experience, but what a, a psychedelic drug does by activating um, all of the cortical columns and bringing them close to firing and promoting gamma oscillations, it promotes, it's sort of a democratization really of these thalamocortical columns or a repotentiation, if you like, of the thalamocortical system where these novel activation patterns are possible. C columns that wouldn't normally become involved in the thalamocortical state do so. And this is really basic, the basis of the psychedelic uh, experience. But DMT is very different. It doesn't seem to do this. It doesn't give an unpredictable, fluid representation of the world, which is what psychedelic drugs do. They, they change the world from being stable and predictable to be fluid and unpredictable, really. Um, DMT seems to shift the thalamocortical system into generating a completely different but highly regular pattern of, uh, of intrinsic activity that builds a highly crystalline, clear, stable uh, other world. So it's a completely different mode of action to um, regular psychedelic drugs, if you like. 